being really energetic and, and involved, like serious hobbyists are. You've seen serious hobbyists. And even after it's over, the stage, like the civil rights movement or the environmental, more, more recently, but the older ones, uh, if you set aside the Civil War, uh, the women's suffrage movement, the anti-slavery movement, the labor industrial movement, the farmer populist progressive, before and after, there was never more than 1%. There was, however, a large public opinion behind them afterwards, you know, when, when it matured. When they started, it was very lonely. Six women in an upstate New York farmhouse, 1846. Rosa Parks, 1955. Uh, the Flint uh, sit-down strikes for the UAW uh, in, uh, in the 1930s. The farmer progressive uh, effort started in uh, 200 counties in uh, eastern Texas went into Oklahoma. That was just a handful of farmers who went door to door and collected dues, a dollar dues. That's like 70, 80 bucks now. That was a lot for a poor dirt farmer. So why don't we get this message when we're youngsters? Why are we constantly told directly and indirectly you can't fight City Hall. You can't take on Exxon. It's overwhelming. The corporations are too big. The Koch brothers are too rich. Why are we told this? Why are we constantly told where we disagree between left, right, blue state, red state, liberal, conservative? Well, we do disagree, obviously, on things like school prayer, reproductive rights, constitutionally required balanced budget, things like that. I mean, they're, they're gun control, but it's almost all, all what they focus on, the media, the politicians, the politicians have an interest because that's how they raise money, and that's how they identify themselves with either left, right, okay, I'm yours, send me money, uh, it doesn't really work if, uh, if a politician tries to appeal to both, <clears throat> because people uh, have sharp uh, opinions and, and sharp sense of injustice. They want to support, stop the XL pipeline, you know, and uh, and the media <clears throat> loves it because it's exciting. I mean, rough, you know, the talk radio host, uh, they don't want to talk about convergence. They don't want to talk about areas of agreement. They want to talk about slashing controversies. And so what happens is the whole society falls prey to the time-honored millennial tactic of the powerful few who decide for the many, which is divide and rule. That's the technique. The last thing they want to see is left-right converging because it's unstoppable. Left-right is automatically a majority. I don't mean all left or all right on issue A, B, C, D, but a substantial amount of left, right. Now, I could use the cliche, I don't know about you, <laughs> but I want to win. And liberals want to win, progressives want to win, libertarians want to win, conservatives want to win, paleo-conservatives want to win. <laughs> and they're not winning very often by themselves. And if we want to win, we lock arms, not bipartisanship. As Grover Norquist said to one of our gatherings in Washington when the book came out, he said, this is not bipartisanship. This is not where we've invaded Afghanistan. And the question is, should Obama send 60,000 more soldiers or 30,000 more soldiers. And we cut the difference. So left, right agrees, 45,000. No, this is where the agreement is already there over issues that need to be converged over. It's already there. It's already there in the minds of people, public opinion. So when I uh, interviewed Ed Crane, who's a libertarian founder of the Cato Institute, 
the dreaded Cato. <laughs> you say the liberals and progressives. You have anything to do with the Cato Institute? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our side has to get over the if <laughs> problem, right? Okay, the Cato Institute is lousy on full Medicare for all. It's terrible on health and safety regulation. I mean, so terrible it's absurd, they can't even argue it by the time I get through with them. <laughs> There's nothing left. That's how absurd it is, you know, the dogmatism. <coughs> I did this with Milton Friedman once when I debated him. He, he kept swatting me away on one area after another. He didn't even want doctors to be licensed. I said, doctors shouldn't be licensed? A certain level of training? He said, right, nothing can be worse than the AMA cartel. I said, well, you mean a, a barber can put a sign up and say gastrointestinal uh, operations today, 20% off? And he said, yes. I said, well, do you realize what happens? He said, sooner or later, people will know to avoid it. I said, how about the sooner people? So I finally got him to admit because he's a market guy, okay? Market. Uh, so I said, the market is premised on sensory awareness. Smell, taste, a sense of price, okay? I mean, you have no sensory awareness. How are you going to understand what's being sold to you or feedback, whether you want to bargain, go on credit? I, I, he knew I was maneuvering him. And he, he said, yeah, oh, yes, uh, information is key to a market system. I said, well, have you smelled carbon monoxide lately? <laughs> How about molybdenum? You know, molten <coughs> molybdenum. How about asbestos? How about radiation? So he finally admitted that that had to be regulated. Pollution had to be regulated. Whoa. <coughs> Here's, here's the areas. There are 25 areas of convergence. And one, some of them sound a bit esoteric, but they're very important. They're only esoteric because we don't have discussions. They're only esoteric because most of these left-right convergences are off the table from the Republican Democrat Party. In fact, when I was running in 2008 for president, I had 18 issues. I've left the website open, it's votenator.org, and you'll see 18 issues, most of them majoritarian supported by the American people, completely off the table of Obama and McCain, never discussed on the debates, never discussed on the hustings, no discussion. You don't discuss anything, how, how are you going to ever get it going? And that's when you know that these issues are important, because when it, the way you can see issues that are important, if you know nothing else, ask two questions. Are they treated as dull? And are they on the table? Traffic safety was very dull years ago. They didn't want it to be exciting. People started saying, what about the cars? Not only the driver, what about the highway? So the first one is audit the Pentagon. Uh, Pentagon's $800 million. Do you know that it has never been audited? I mean, there are people here who have businesses, work in business. Uh, hey, Dana, what would happen if this bookstore is never audited? I hate to think. <laughs> uh, $800 billion, they can't produce the data to be audited by the Government Accounting Office of the U.S. Congress. Every year, the GAO, you know, they do it for all departments agencies, they say. We finished our report on the Pentagon, but we don't have the data to provide an audit. That is why nine billion, billion dollars disappeared in the first few weeks of the uh, criminal invasion of Iraq by Bush and Cheney, who are still fugitives in justice. Always think of them that way, they're criminals. Literally criminals, not metaphorically. Literally criminals under a number of laws, including the FISA law, where you don't snoop on people <coughs> without a judicial uh, warrant. 
Six billion disappeared in the State Department. That's not very well audited under General Isima Hillary Clinton's regime. <laughs> it's very easy when you militarize the State Department to mess up with where the money goes. By definition, it's secret. Six billion. As Everett Dirksen used to say, the Republican from Illinois, remember that one? You know, to paraphrase it, nine billion here, six billion there, pretty soon it adds up to real money. <laughs> Now, this one would come in, it goes through the roof. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's 99% support, but it's over 90%. You wanna talk about left, right? Who in their right mind would run an $800 billion operation year after year and not have it auditable? Well, there's a little group trying to do it, but it is never discussed by the Republican Democratic candidates because people say, what's your excuse? Why haven't you pushed for this? Because they're part of the military industrial complex. They get money from Lockheed. They get money from Raytheon. They get money from Boeing. They have no interest because we're not putting the heat on them. So they have more to fear from us than they have to fear from their paymasters. Because us involves votes. That's more important than money. Liberals love to focus on money and policy. It is very important, but if you're obsessed by it, you forget to organize votes because you're working on money. Got to reform, campaign finance reform. Remember David Bratt who beat Eric Cantor? There is some justice in the world. <laughs> well, Cantor outspent him 27 to 1 in the primary a few weeks ago in Virginia. He's the number two Republican in the House of Representatives. And um, he went on Fox the 91, David Bratt, and here's what he told us. Quote, money doesn't vote, voters vote. Amen. See, he focused on votes. He focused on getting it out. The second one, uh, left, right disagree, uh, agrees. Most of them are against corporate welfare. You know, the right calls it crony capitalism, and they go nuts against cr crony capitalism. It destroys the whole essence of market compensation, uh, co uh, competition and market determinism. Because what crony capitalism means, when General Electric or Pfizer or Merck or Citigroup or Bank of America or Prudential, uh, when they get in trouble, they go to Washington for a bailout or for some inflated contract or some kind of subsidy, handout, giveaway, and that disrupts normal market proceedings. And they really don't like it. We call it the corporate state or uh, corporate welfare. That's a big one. A third one, look how easy this one is. Put all government contracts and leaseholds and grants online. <laughs> That's super, right? So we went to Bush's first head of OMB, Mitch Daniels, and, and, and it, near the White House, and he said, how about it? He said, fine. He put a notice in the Federal Register. The lobbyists kicked in, the bureaucrats said, nobody wanted to do it. It's too expensive. He said, you already have it formatted. What are you talking about? It's, too, it's like you have to take up the paper. You have formatted. It's all done. That's how you negotiate the contract. So they, they gave in so that all government contracts above a minimum uh, can be are summarized online. That's not enough. We want the full text. In 2006, Senator Obama and Senator Coburn, right, liberal conservative, uh, put a bill in. But the lobbyists, it's very hard for the lobbyists overtly to oppose this. The lobbyists put a damper on it and sort of broke the momentum. But that's a left right. Every all the think tanks in Washington want that whether they're Cato or Economic Policy Institute or, or, or whatever. That's not a highly exciting thing until you start getting granular. It's over $500 billion a year with a B. It involves health contracts. It involves administering Medicare, Medicaid. It involves contracting out the paperwork for child support. It involves Pentagon contracts. It involves leaseholds on the public lands, 
where we give away our hard rock minerals. No other country, company, country in the world gives away its hard rock minerals like gold, lead, olympium, uh, as we do. Well, we're not quite give it away. It's five bucks an acre. So <laughs> the gold company in a barrack, a big gold company in Canada, uh, a number of years ago found uh, nine billion dollars of our gold on Nevada public land. And under the 1872 Act, they went to Washington with the geologists. They demonstrated that it was that, and they wanted a few thousand acres over uh, the deposits, and they got it for $30,000. No royalties back. Dust. And the cyanide waste, well, we'll clean those up later when the, when the mine is exhausted. Did you learn that in the fifth grade? How about the eighth grade? Junior in high school, perhaps? Mm -hmm. How about sophomore in college? Mm -hmm. Anybody? How about law school? Mm -hmm. Huh? And, and we don't talk about myths and cover-ups? Mm -hmm. well, that's what we do, Ed. Half of education, just swallowing what isn't so. It's learning what isn't so. Memorization, regurgitation, vegetation. Mm -hmm. American history is taught most of it lies. You know, we bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima because we wanted to save a, a million soldiers' lives, as if we were going door to door in Yokohama. <laughs> they were on their knees. It was totally devastated. We did it to signal to the Russians. Those were not military targets. Those were literally terrorizing the population, that's a phrase, so that it kills their morale and they revolt against their rulers and kills their productivity. So the Truman, you know, He's been rehabilitated, he's a mass murderer. Mm -hmm. There are generals who opposed him, like uh, minor figures, like General George Marshall, mm -hmm. Five Star, mm -hmm. Eisenhower, mm -hmm. Admiral Nimitz, head of the Pacific Fleet. Huh? This, this, this mule from Missouri didn't want to listen. 200,000 people incinerated mm -hmm. right on the spot, not to mention the rest of it. I mean, Japanese culture must be completely bereft of revenge. If they did that to us, in 15 centuries, we'd never let them forget them. <laughs> so there are these things that sound dull, but when you reify them and exemplify them in normal terms, they get really interesting. Really interesting. Especially when half of our government is contracted out outsource, contracted out. I mean, uh, I used to be in the army as a cook. Yeah, the army would feed itself. Now, the army doesn't feed itself. Subcontracts to KBR in Texas, and they charge them 38 bucks a plate. And if they use a second plate because it's hot food and there's no extra food, it's another 38 bucks because the contract says it's by the paper plate or the plastic plate. It's interesting, doesn't it, when you get down to the specifics and how the outsourcing is not a way to be efficient, it's a way to waste more taxpayer dollars. Here's one that's counterintuitive, it's, it's going operational. A lot of the left-right, all of it starts with public opinion. And all of my 25, 24 examples are already in public opinion, pretty much. Uh, but it, it starts going operational when it gets visible, it gets marches, petitions, testimony, left, right, uh, the media covers it, and the next stage it gets on the table of the Republicans. Then they have to discuss it, they have to debate it, the press covers it, the polls cover it, you're on your way. Well, the one that's halfway there now is restoring the minimum wage. It comes in 70 to 80 percent, uh, that means that's left, right. You can't have 70-80% without significant left-right. And uh, 30 million people make less today than workers made in 1968. And worker productivity, according to our economists, has doubled. So that one Walmart worker today does the work of two because of streamlining, automation, all the rest. Not that they were lazy in 1968. It's more automated. Now, you think 30 million people uh, would be a big issue. I tried to make it an issue in 2008, 2010, 
2012. No way. People say, why are you so tough on the Democratic Party? Well, let me put it in the most benign way I can put it. The Democratic Party no longer can defend our country from the worst Republican Party in history. A party that openly espouses vicious, cruel, brutish, corporatist policies that might be supported by 15 or 20 percent of the people. And they can't even beat them. So you say to the Democrats on Capitol Hill, you say, look what, the, look what Boehner and, and Cantor passed in 2012, 2013. You tabulated it. 60 dangerous votes. Actually, I pushed them to do this. And they put it out reluctantly, two months before the election in 2012, reluctantly. Do they really want to win or do they just want to win their race? Their gerrymandered district. Do they really care about us? So they put out 60 dangerous votes and they didn't even use them. These are votes against children, infants, women, consumers, cancer, I mean, you name it. There isn't anything these Republicans wouldn't vote against or for that is contrary to their corporate paymasters. They don't want the banks regulated. They don't want the auto companies regulated. They don't want dangerous drugs coming in from China, curtailed, because that's regulation. They want to weaken the food safety laws. Don't you think you could win an election on that? Huh? So I say to them, look, let's boil it down. Let's boil it down. Do you agree that this is the cruelest, most vicious, most wasteful, most corporate indentured, most anti-labor, most anti-environment, most anti-consumer party of the Republicans in history? And they say, absolutely. And I say, why aren't you landsliding? <laughs> First, they're dialing for the same dollars. Second, they just care about their own district, and it's safe. Most of it's safe, it's gerrymandered. They don't care about the overall political alignment of the country, although they would dispute that. But I would rebut them with their behavior. And so 2010, 2012, they refused to make minimum wage an issue. I went to Trumpka, the head of the AFL-CIO. What are you waiting for, Rich? You've got television ad cap cap capabilities. You keep pointing to the White House, bitching like crazy, but you won't do anything Obama doesn't want to do. And the same is true for Nancy Pelosi. What are you waiting for? Do you have any feeling what it's like for people who are growing our food, serving our food, cleaning up after us, taking care of our ailing grandparents, working themselves to the bone for eight bucks an hour? Nine bucks an hour? Ralph, I don't need you to lecture me. <laughs> I said, I'm not lecturing you. I'm just saying, I don't think you want to win. Those 30 million workers can be unionized. I say to the head of the AFL, do you see how? See, the problem is, their checks never bounce. Their, pay, their paychecks never bounce. They live in a nice place on 16th Street. It's a big marble white building near the White House good offices, air conditioned, don't ever get caught at 445 in a union headquarters uh, hallway. Don't get caught. It's an occupational hazard. They're getting the hell out of it. Okay? So it's really very, you know, you make fun of it, it's unbelievably dis disappointing. When you think, all they have to do is go like this and they can make minimum wage. Well, we finally made it. Finally made the minimum wage. Here's what it took. Remember what I said, it's easier than you think? Already cities are passing, like San Jose, you know, Santa Fe, New Mexico. They're passing higher minimum wage. They're going to eight, nine, maybe 9.50. Seattle is going much more uh, this fall. Uh, 21 states are above the seven and a quarter minimum wage. That's the federal minimum wage now, seven and a quarter. 21 states are in the 8, 8, 25, whatever. And 
the adjusted inflation minimum wage from 1968 is about eleven dollars. Mm -hmm. So at eleven dollars, you're making what they made 46 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I don't like to say raise the minimum wage. I like to say restore it. So here's what it took. It took maybe three dozen people who research and write and justify the minimum wage, including our group. It took, I would say, the demonstrations in front, uh, stimulated by SEIU, very modest amount of money, compared to what they give the Democrats every two years for their advertising budgets. It took, uh, Let's see, they demonstrated uh, in front of McDonald's, Walmart, they just had a 1,200 person demonstration in the Midwest, that was their biggest one. They demonstrate in front of Burger King, you know, the fast food. Two thirds of all low income workers are employed by big companies. And two thirds of all low income workers are women. Uh, so how many is that? Less than the population of Torrington, Connecticut. 25,000 at the most, spent a few hours here, a few hours there. We picketed Walmart in Connecticut, total of 10, 12 hours. It's now the number two issue for the Democrats in a November election, economically, domestic issue. And a few reporters, a few television reporters, newspaper reporters. You see, see what, and it hasn't yet won in Congress, but Congress is the last to get the left-right message. <laughs> They're the last. State legislators get it earlier, town, towns and cities. But look how little it took. And you keep saying, I keep telling you, it doesn't take much. Here's how disappointing what it drives you to. One day, I, I hauled 10, 10 of my associates, and I said, we're going to pick at the National Association the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It's right opposite Lafayette Square, right opposite the White House. So we picketed it, and then we went around the corner, this on minimum wage, and we picketed the AFL-CIO headquarters. <laughs> so I figured, you know, you always want to give people some reading material. So I had a little book called America Needs a Raise, 1998, written by the former head of the AFL-CIO. John Sweeney. So I figured this is a winner. You got these people walking in and out of this building, you know, going up the steps, scurry, scurry, scurry. Most of them, I don't know how they don't trip. Right? Be a neck problem in America coming soon. And we'd hand out, we'd hand out the book. Half of them wouldn't even take it. It's their own former boss. Sick, decayed, stagnant. You got to save us from Washington. All of them. Look at the look at the left right on big banks. Comes in at ninety percent. Break up the big New York banks. They're too big to fail. We don't want this again. We don't want to crash the economy, recession, unemployment, and then the inevitable taxpayer bailout. That's pretty good. Left right. How about eminent domain? That's probably 95%. That's where the city of New London in Connecticut, eminent domain, the whole neighborhood of homes, demolished it to give it to Pfizer Corporation. <clears throat> and they won in the Supreme Court. But you know how they won? Four of the five in the 5-4 decision that said a city can take private property and give it to private corporate property instead of, you know, for hot, for highways and bridges. That's what eminent domain is for, you know, serious public purpose. It was a 5-4 decision. Four were the liberals. Steve Breyer, Sotomayor, so four were the liberals. And uh, one was the conservative. The dissent were the conservatives. But the liberals didn't represent liberal opinion out there. That, that came in so high that after that decision, 22 state legislatures passed bills saying, not in our state. You're not going to get away with that. You're not going to take people's homes, demolish, and give it to a corporation. Uh, Postscript, 
about two years later, uh, Pfizer decided it didn't want to use the land and it moved to another location <laughs> outside of Rwanda. I had a little interview with Ed Crane, the head of the Cato Institute. He's very concise. Some people call him brusque. It's in the book. He says, Ralph, I oppose all corporate subsidies, unconstitutional wars, the freedom restrictions of the Patriot Act, and the Federal Reserve run amok. I said, that's pretty good start, Ed. <laughs> Those aren't trivial things, you know. But we have war crimes coming out of Washington, bipartisan. Gets worse every four years, because we let them get away with it every four years. So there are more illegal drone activity now under Obama than there was under Bush. More special forces moving into countries violating national sovereignties and a lot of other stuff and more civilians getting killed on the other hand Bush invaded Iraq with Cheney and a million Iraqis easily have lost their lives and the whole country is being blown apart so was that war declared no war resolution doesn't quite cut it I don't think that's what Madison and Jefferson had in mind I didn't think they had a mind where the Royal Resolution is passed and said, and said, Mr. Bush, Mr. Cheney, you decide when to start the war. Congress abandoning its oath of office, which gave it the exclusive right to declare war and nobody else. They did not want another King George <laughs> to plunge the nation into the war. They didn't want another president, one person, uh, to do it. Here's one. How many of you agree that all those contracts you have to sign on the dotted line that you can hardly see, the fine print? Okay, do you notice that over the years, when I was in law school, it's gotten more and more one-sided for the vendor. And they're stripping you of right after right. They've stripped you now of the right to go to court. No government can strip you of the right to go to court. But American Express can, Kaiser can, General Motors can, if they have a compulsory arbitration in the fine print. If you agree to it, you agree to it. Probably never saw it. You're helped to agree to it. I'll tell you why we don't read it, by the way, in a moment. But this is the worst one of all. You know, freedom of contract, according to some conservatives, is about the most treasured pillar of a market dominated society. I mean, meeting of the minds. You only pay for what you agree to, you know, that sort of thing. No trap doors. Well, now the corporate lawyers have inserted what's called the unilateral modification provision which means that your friendly airline, Delta, or US Air, can decide that the 100,000 frequent flyer miles you've piled up aren't gonna buy as many round trips. So if they were gonna buy five round trips, or four, they can make it only three. Unilateral modification. Which means that you have agreed in advance that the seller the bank, the insurance company, the seller can change the terms of the agreement later, unilaterally, and you're stuck. Go to faircontracts.org and you'll see our project, faircontracts.org. There hasn't yet been a demonstration, but I think we're organizing a credit card burning <laughs> demo pretty soon. You see how they put us to sleep? You talk to 10 year olds and 15 and 20 year olds, they don't know anything but signing on the dotted line. Nothing. It's just automatic. It's like it's in the DNA. What else can you do? We put a book out once, How to Avoid Buying Lemon Cars. You know, defective cars, cars that have rough edges bad construction, bad repair. How many people here have bought a lemon car? <laughs> okay. 
at the end of the book, we had a model consumer purchase contract. Now, if you want to buy a car, you take this contract. It's in big print, clear English. You copy it, and you go into the dealer. And you look around the various cars, and the salesperson is smiling, waving, open the car door, <laughs> smell it, you know, random smell, 400 horsepower. It's like, okay, I'm going to pick this one up. So they sit you down, they, how much you, how much you're going to get for your used car, what, you know, how are you going to finance it, and then you say, well, excuse me, uh, what's this you have here? And the salesman says, it's the contract, mm -hmm. you're supposed to sign it. No, 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 I have it. <laughs> <laughs> Put it down. And I said, here. <laughs> so we said uh, we want to hear from people who actually did. Even I was surprised. This is how tough it is to go in and cross out the warranty, double it, put your initial. You try to change a fine print contract, right? You can, it's fun, especially if you don't care whether you buy the product. <laughs> A little culture jamming, maybe. Here's what happened. The guy writes me, he said, I did what you asked me to do. I went down, I went to buy, I picked out the Chevy, and put down the contract. And he said, you won't believe what happened? They called the cops. <laughs> See how ingrained it is? <laughs> The second one was even more absurd, although not quite as funny. But the salesman looks at it, rushes to the glass container where the you know the glass office where the manager is, and and, and, and the the letter writer was looking. You know, they're all. And then all of a sudden, the salesperson and the manager come roaring out of this glass thing. They said, "You dirty communist, get the hell out of here!" That's how outraged they are that you dare to alter the terms of the contract. But the only way to do it is to just go in, you want to buy something, but you think you want to buy it, but you don't really want to buy it. <laughs> and so you say, I, uh, uh, I sort of like this little gadget, but what's this fine print? Ah, oh, you don't have to worry about that. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, we really like your patronage. And you say, no, no, no. I, I don't want this, give it. And you start scratching it up and changing it. And what do you, we can't sell you under the, oh, is that, gee, that's too bad. I, I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll see you next week. <laughs> you get a few thousand people doing that. Yeah. You know, it starts getting, maybe they'll start teaching it in the schools. <laughs> Heaven forbid the consumer education course. It's <laughs> so trivial as five trillion dollars of goods and services every year that goes through yeah. these fine print, contra. <clears throat> Community rooted businesses. Here's one, Dana. That's a left-right alliance. Mm -hmm. Whether you're conservative or liberal, you kind of like farmer to consumer markets. You kind of like the community bank or the credit union. You kind of like getting local energy, you know, renewable. You really like that community health clinic that focuses on prevention and doesn't process you like you are an item on an accounting sheet. And Yes Magazine chronicles uh, what's going on around the country. It's now tens of billions of dollars, even if you don't count credit unions which have 70 million members. That is a really big one. Let me tell you, I mean, you already know, but let me just iterate it. Every time you spend money in a community bank, take out a mortgage, every time you spend money in a farmer's market, every time you spend money in a community clinic, every time you spend money on renewable local, you are weakening the sales of Bank of America, Citigroup, the agribusiness giants, the health hospital chains, and ExxonMobil and Peabody Coal. That's called displacement. The displacement movement is really the most powerful way 
to take power away from the giant multinationals and bring them down to the community level. That's another left right. And that can be advocated in terms of why are you subsidizing and favoring the giant corporations against the little guys? And that happens all the time. In the tax area, all different ways, there's a tremendous tilt in favor of the big corporations against the smaller firms, the cooperatives, and the like. This one comes in, maybe it comes in to 110%, I'm not sure. <laughs> undermining and circumventing and overriding parental authority and commercially marketing bad things to little children. Junk food, junk drink, violent program, cosmetics for girls at age seven, seven, lethal toys for boys at age five. What parent hasn't gone through the marketing to little kids in effect telling them to nag their parents? Nag their parents for a $100 Nintendo, whatever, game, instead of sitting down in the living room or in the sunroom and playing with your child with blocks or any other cognitive type, harm, harmless uh, toys. I once talked to an evangelical audience. They gave me a standing ovation. It doesn't surprise me at all. It doesn't matter whether you're a right-wing parent or a left-wing parent. You don't like to be undermined in the authority and parental guidance by some racketeering marketeers on television with very manipulative ads tested on three-year-olds, four, five, six, seven-year-olds who I call electronic child molesters. That's what they are. They're, they're getting kids to buy stuff that's going to make them obese, juvenile diabetics, premature high blood pressure, and interacting with mayhem and violence and severing limbs and vaporing people. For starters, <laughs> left-right alliance. Just more quickly, a few of these. I think there's a left-right alliance against the patenting of life forms, like genetic engineering. Now, once people learn about it, they really almost can't believe it, that Monsanto and others have thousands of monopoly patents on our gene sequences, not to mention plants and other animals that they're even more bolder on. Left, right on giving investors, pension funds, mutual funds, individual investors more power over their companies. Right now we have corporations who say they're capitalists. Capitalists are supposed to be controlled by their owners to some degree. That's one of the indicias of ownership. And what they say to their owners is, if you don't like that we're paying our CEO $11,000 an hour, which is what Walmart CEO was paid, $11,000 an hour, 20, you know, eight hours a day, uh, sell your stock. In other words, they say, you don't like the way we're running the country, uh, the company and the country, <laughs> sell your stock. In other words, exit. Not voice. Now, oh no, we're not selling our stock because w we know how to get rid of you. You're our hired hand and you're out of here. No way. They have rigged the system where they would have made the old election system set up by the Kremlin blush. It's so authoritarian. Blush. Let's take uh, one that's counterintuitive. Full Medicare for all, everybody in, nobody out. Free choice of doctor and hospital. Everybody covered for half the per capita cost of what we are now enduring, Obamacare or no Obamacare. $9,300 per capita in Canada is $4,500 per capita. And they cover everybody from cradle to grave. And I dare say at least as good. And they have better outcomes. Do you know that since Harry Truman proposed it, it's come in majority pu public opinion? The last poll I saw had 59% of the doctors, over 60% of nurses, and in that range for people, even though there's very few uh, high visibility promoters of single payer health insurance these days. So even when it's all one side, 
uh, and the other side is, is not getting much visibility, they still like it better. Why wouldn't they like it better? Who likes this complexity? The bills, the printouts, the fine print, the screwed up forms of denial. Even under Obamacare, it's like a thousand pages. You know how, how long the Canadian Medicare bill was when it passed in the 60s? Covered everybody. Free choice of doctor and hospital, which most of us don't have now with these networks and so on. 13 pages. <laughs> and you have a card. You get sick, you have an operation. Here, you go into a hospital and the first question is, are you insured? Do you have the money? In Canada, they just show the card. And if you're insured, what, you know, then you go into the details of the insurance and you're gagging, you know, you, you want to go to an emergency. It's amazing what Americans can take. They can take more abuse than anybody short of people in Bangladesh because they have less reason to. And yet they take it, partly because divide and rule. When they got Medicare and Medicaid, that took a lot of the steam out of the drive in the 60s under Lyndon Johnson for full. That was, they do that often. It's very clever. They chip off the areas where there'd be most uh, aggressive uh, demands <coughs> uh, uh, for change. Well, a couple more and then we can hear from you. War on drugs. That's coming in more and more left right. Grover Norquist and uh, other prominent right wing people started a group called Right on Crime because they say billions of dollars are being lost for long sentences for nonviolent offenders possessing some marijuana. New Gingrich teamed up, by the way. And so they're locking arms with liberal and progressive prison reform. Left right legislators in 15 states in the last five years or so have passed juvenile justice reform mm -hmm. when it was considered no way. But when you had left right, unstoppable. Again, the unstoppable issue. And the last one that uh, I want to talk about is difficult, aside from uh, growing majorities against NAFTA and WTO and the Pacific Trade Agreement, and those corporate managed agreements, is um, it's the one that deals with the public commons. It's hard to teach conservatives about the commons. They don't really believe in public land. <clears throat> but once you get down very specific and you say the public airways belong to us, we're the landlords, the radio and TV stations, the tenants, they have a license free from the Federal Communications Commission to decide who says what 24 hours a day and who doesn't say what 24 hours a day and they program their station. Do you think they should be charged rent? And I'm getting more and more conservative saying, why, isn't that what an ordinary business would do? No ordinary business would give the property away to profit-making companies. So that's one we really all have to work on because the richest uh, assets in the entire country do not belong to the plutocracy. They don't belong to the top 1%. They belong to us. But one third of America is the public lands. That's before you get offshore. The public airways, in almost every industry that brags about how innovative it is, you wouldn't recognize it without trillions of your taxpayer dollars giving them free research and development free clinically tested anti-cancer drugs, free aerospace for the aerospace industry, biotech industry, the Navy containerization industry, the computer industry, the Pentagon, the internet, you've heard all that. I mean, you wouldn't even recognize Silicon Valley. There wouldn't be a Silicon Valley. The basic research. I remember the head of Intel five years ago came, well, he just retired, you know, Andy Grove, he went to the Senate to testify. And he had some rumblings that they were going to start cutting the R&D credit. Can you imagine? They, you, the taxpayer, pay these corporations to do research and development. Like they have no interest in doing research and development. They have to be subsidized. And so he's making the case to continue the R&D tax credit. The tax credit is basically, as you know, if you ever have a credit, is 
it's dollar for dollar. I mean, it's like giving you a check from the treasury. So if, if Intel has a tax credit of a uh, billion dollars, and, and they have to pay a billion dollars in taxes on their profit, it rubs it up. It's not a deduction, it's a tax credit. And he is saying, and he's a very smart guy. I've met him, he's written books, he's no fool. I mean, he's not the normal, avaricious, gimme, gimme CEO. But he made a very important point. He said, you know, we're not the industry. We're not very good at basic research. We're good at applied engineering, gadgets, you know, like Steve Jobs, but not on basic. And if you want our industry to be first in the world, you must maintain this R&D tax credit. And of course, it operates for drug companies. It operates for General Electric. General Electric went 10 years in the last decade before two, three years ago. They made Billions of dollars of U.S. profits, zero federal income tax. Zero, right? It's supposed to be 35%, zero. Same with Verizon, a number of years. You can get all this information by going to Citizens for Tax Justice, uh, ctj.org. And it's beautifully done. They'll, they'll give you the top 25 most egregious giant corporate tax uh, SKPs and you can go with there. You can be very proud of yourself because you paid one dollar to U.S. Treasury. You paid more than they did. In sheer dollars. Now here's my favorite bill. How many of you have ever had a two dollar bill? It's, I mean, I like it. And so few use it when you get it from the bank. It's like it's just been printed. That's Jefferson. And then, do you remember the picture? This is the gathering of the white males, fairly affluent, who got together July 4, 1776, to sign the Declaration of Independence. And they were upper income white males. Not very celebrated today, huh? And one of them said it outright. Most of them knew it. They thought they were signing a death warrant. This is against the most powerful army in the world at that time, the British Army, the Redcoats. So we put this up and a lot of our storefront and so on. And underneath, we say, aren't you glad these people showed up? <laughs> and then the obvious corollary, do you show up? Do you show up for town meetings? Do you show up to vote? Do you show up for marches? Do you show up for rallies? Do you show up in the courtroom? If you don't, you're a quitter. Because if you don't show up, there's no democratic society that can survive. And 1% showing up is nice. It'd be nice to go to 2% or 3%. And we're not teaching young people to show up. It's the worst I've ever seen. They're totally addicted to virtual reality and to their little gadgets and to their little te 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 you know, text messages. Massive narcissistic high velocity gossip. <laughs> so, I'm not talking to you literally because you show up. You wouldn't be here if you didn't show up. <laughs> it's the people you talk to. It's the people you know agree with you on a municipal issue or a county issue or a state issue or a national issue. And you beg them on the phone or whatever way you communicate, please show up. And they're always busy. Or they got something else to do this morning for them. So I, I hope you resurrect this. I understand that there are fewer $2 bills in currency than $100 bills. 80% of all $100 bills circulate abroad. You know what that's for. <laughs> Cargo planes with your $100 tax bills go off to Afghanistan. I had a soldier once tell me, uh, I met him in a supermarket, I said, what did you do? He said, well, I worked right north of Kandahar at the, uh, actually at the Kabul airport. He said, well, what, what did you do? He said, well, I received crates full of $100 bills that I had to redirect and you know, send into the hinterland. <laughs>
That's, this is a detour. All right, I've, I, I've taken enough of your time. I want, I'd like you to read the book and, and have discussions with your neighbors. I know that book clubs have a habit of only discussing uh, fiction books. And this distresses me because there's this strain in our culture where, yeah, I go fishing with Roy, but I never talk politics with him. <laughs> it's like politics is something icky, a dirty word. Like they say, well, that's politics. But you know the derivation. That's the essential democratic word, small d. So I hope if you do have a book club, you'll make an exception for something that's serious about your country, your world, and your descendants. And it shouldn't be difficult or tension producing to talk with your friends and neighbors about things that might be controversial. And when you do it in a left-right alliance, it, it reduces the, the, the strain because you already have come together knowing that you agree on the particular goal and you want to elaborate it and develop strategies for action. That's how we won the False Claims Act of 1986. We beat the, the Breeder Reactor Left, right, 1983, beat General Electric, Ronald Reagan, Freedom of Information Act, the Auto Safety Act passed unanimously in the House of Representatives. I want to talk about a left, right. There's a lot of history and a lot of examples. To lift our morale, we're too darn demoralized in this country. We make too many excuses for ourselves because we have inflated the power of the few and diminished the power of the many. Thank you very much. this conversation when you come no, up no, with no, your book. No, no, just three or four questions. Oh, you're gonna and then we'll chat a little bit. But I don't want to hold people up who have other commitments. Okay, right. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, Ralph, I wanted you to know that uh, the challenge to the California High Speed Rail Project, which is on the front page of the Chronicle, today, yeah. is a left-right alliance. No. That transit advocates are working with hard, hard conservatives who yeah. don't want to see high-speed rail happen, and we're working together very nicely. By the way, we're up against the left-right alliance. It's called the Corporate Democrats and the Corporate Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> this is, that's the one we're, uh, that's a very tight alliance, yeah. for sure. Way back? Yes, Ralph, uh, thank you for the talk. I wanted to ask you, what, what can I do, what can we do to help convince um, people like me on the left, used to be on the left, used to be a Democrat, I, I used to be a Democrat, I'm no longer a Democrat, but that the Democratic Party is corporate owned, is corrupt, and that the fact that we liberals continue to carry water for it is part of the problem. I don't know how to do that. I'm, uh, I find I kind of put people off, but I really want that message to get out there. I don't know what's there. Hey, what? I'm glad, I'm glad you raised it because th this is not a left-right alliance <laughs> so much to affect elections. This is a left-right alliance to give orders to incumbents, no matter who they are. And when senators see that there's a left-right alliance that basically says, forget about getting us involved in another war in the Middle East and Syria, and it came in 60 to 1, it didn't matter whether they were Republican or Democratic senators, they ran for cover. The same with the near victory last year to ban the NSA from Dragnet Snoopy that almost passed the House. It was left, right, Republican, Democrats, defying Pelosi and Boehner, their leaders, and just missed by about 10 votes. And that's because they saw it coming in. People do not like to have their government snoop on everything, their email and telephones, and collect it for future reference. So I'm glad you raised it because it, it gave me the opportunity to make that. This is not a elect your better person. This is saying it would be nice to have better persons elected. It would be nice to have campaign finance reform, but this is a left-right alliance of such majority decisiveness uh, that 
it comes in hard on the incumbents regardless of what their labels are. Go third parties. I hope on the left and the right we get more action on that. Well, th you can do all that. There's no, there's no either or here. There's just an a, a invitation to focus on incumbents. Once you focus on incumbents, they tend to behave different at election time anyway. It's just doing it from the other end. Yes, sir. Um, would you touch on the sale of U.S. post offices and what's happening to the property? Oh, yeah. We put two reports out on the, on the post office, U.S. Postal Service. I'm a big defender. I just you know, spoke to the people at, at Berkeley to save the wonderful Berkeley post office. This is a manufactured crisis. It started in 2006 when they required the Postal Service to prepay 75 years of health premium. <laughs> and then prepay way out in retirement benefits. So the U.S. Postal Service, which hasn't gotten a dime in tax money since it started in 1970, created by Nixon, the Congress, it is owed $60 billion by the U.S. government. It's the only corporation in the country is a major creditor of Uncle Sam. Now, because they haven't been able to pay recent installments of this crazy prepayment, what other company prepays 75 years? Uh, they, they defaulted on 15 billion. Uh, but still, that means Uncle Sam still owes them tens of billions of dollars. So what is this all about? It's all about to crash the post office financially and then say, well, the internet you don't need a post office, you got the internet, and you got UPS, and you got Federal Express, and, and who cares? And the reporters in Washington, they don't use the post office, they, they're very ignorant about it. It's historical traditions, it's potential in the future, it's present area of 32,000 branches, and people gathering in rural, small towns. You know. These intangibles don't mean anything to people, these reporters. And I'm saying 1% of the people, and I hope some of them are postal retirees, just organize in each congressional district. You put a stop to it. If it wasn't for the prepays, even with the recession, even with the internet, the post office in the last two years were just about broken even. We don't ask the Pentagon to make profit. <laughs> I mean, that's another question as to why we expect a public service like the Postal Service. But there's a great website uh, by an English professor at NYU who does it on the side saveourpostoffice.org, I think it is. And anything you want to know is really good. He's really, really good. He's, it's up there. What you can do, what's going on, etc. I can tell you one thing. There weren't 50,000 people active to stop Saturday closing. And Saturday closing has been postponed. Even Daryl Issa can't get it through. I mean, what if 300,000 people, right? What's 300,000 people? 120,000 people watch the Super Bowl. Yeah, Diane Feinstein's husband yeah. is managing the sale. Of yeah, the, yeah. Of the, yeah. What's the name? Office. Blum. What's his last name? Richard. 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 Yeah, Richard Blum. I've written Diane Feinstein about her husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see it. It's, uh, it's on our website. You go to nader.org. Look it up. And I said, look. Look what your husband's doing. He signed the contract, exclusive real estate to sell post offices around the country. So there's no competition. There's not like 10 regions, 10 real estate brokers. Number two, he's able to sell them to his business buddies. Number three, he, he's got a, a way out so it doesn't have to be competitive bidding. The whole thing's crooked. And it was defined as crooked by the Inspector General of the Postal itself. <coughs> now, he didn't use quite that word, but it's very condemnatory, he asked for a revision. So I'm right, Diane Feinstein. I've known her for years. And I said, you know, you're not your husband, but you're a senator. You've got seniority. You can raise the issue. You can press the post office to change the contract and revise it. And apart from even the necessity of selling these posts on it. Well, through a reporter, she said, I'm not my husband's keeper. You know, he's got his own business, I got my own. But, but she's a senator for heaven's sake. <laughs> this is where public policy is made, right? Uh, I, I said, well, 
The only thing left is to prove they filed a joint return. Then she would have the conflict of interest. I'm not sure that was uh, made clear. Yes? Would you comment on ALEC and its power? Yeah, ALEC is, is a lobbying group funded by people like the Koch brothers at the state legislative level, and they organize corporatist state legislators in one state after another, and they wine and they dine them and they give them campaign contributions, and it's called ALEC, it's an acronym, and they, they hire lawyers and they draft all kinds of corporate bills to introduce in the legislature, and a lot of them have passed. So there's a law professor at University, University of Wisconsin-Madison, his name is Joe Rogers, he started a group called ALEC, and he has retained hundreds of law professors and others, and they're drafting bills to be put in state legislatures to counteract ALEC. <laughs> now, this is one man, right? One person. How many times do we have to get through to your friends who think everything's impossible, que sera, sera, that everything starts with one person, two people. Everything starts with a conversation and get it going and then build it up. I thought if you have a letterhead, right, you know, left-right alliance and put the congressional district and then send it to your member and say, there's 20 of us, got 10 and 10. If you don't think that's enough, just tell us, we'll add another zero. <laughs> we'll add another zero. They don't like that. They don't like something building, you see. And then you, you focus on whatever issue you want to focus on. Yes? Pardon? Do you have any comments to make about Common Core standards and uh, the push to privatize public schools? Yeah, spare me Common Core standards. <laughs> <laughs> My only recommendation, other than decent facilities and adequately paid teachers, is civic experience and civic skills, which bring in ways to learn reading, writing, arithmetic, physics, you know, chemistry. So you get these children to understand their community. Drinking water systems. How are the highways built? How does City Hall run? What are the healthcare institutions? Where does the food come from? How is it delivered? What are the supermarkets like? Do they have comparative pricing? All of that, you get tremendously motivated. Youngsters, because it's in their lives. They can begin to teach their parents a few things <laughs> as well. This whole pedagogy being developed to cover the rear of the administrators and the politicians <laughs> by corporate consulting firms who actually create these curriculum ideas and create and then have front groups, educational groups, <clears throat> parade them. It's these corporate consulting firms that are developing this test mania, A, B, C, D, none of the above, multiple choice standardized testing that drive good teachers crazy and prevent any kind of individuation, armor on the shoulder, judgment of the teacher. So we've got to get away from these manipulative distractions and ask ourselves, what kind of knowledge? And knowledge for what? And it isn't just to know how to run a computer. That's just a tool. It's to develop a grounding in the liberal arts and the social sciences and actual experiential learning. That's what sticks. What do you remember from your fifth grade? Yeah, you t just the whole year, what do you remember? What do you remember from your seventh grade? What do you remember? I, I just, if you ask me, what do I remember from my fifth grade? I said, I was a good teacher, I remember. She was a good teacher. She was from Maine, Miss Thompson. What do I remember? Oh, this is the one thing I remember. She walked in one day, and she went to the blackboard. And she wrote on the blackboard, gone, one minute. Don't bother looking for it, you'll never find it again. <laughs> and that was her way of saying, don't delay. And that's, that's the only thing I remember. <laughs> I don't think that would have been part of a common core curriculum. <laughs>
beginning to look into smart meter issues, smart meter programs, government support and corporate utility and installation. The smart meter? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the smart meter is an attempt, you know, to be able to uh, develop supply and demand and straighten out uh, the uh, pricing of electricity so that you, you get encouraged to use electricity uh, when demand is lower than when it's higher, etc. The problem is they're forcing it on us, and once they get smart meters, they know a lot about us. It's extreme invasion of privacy. Never mind unanswered questions about emissions. So in Washington, D.C., they're forcing it on people. About 1% of the people have said no, including us, and we're learning from people in California. There's a group in California that's collected a lot of important information in that regard. They never tell us the full story of these new technologies. It's always their side of the benefit, and they don't open up the, the costs and the intrusions. Um, you, know, you know how they can, hackers can penetrate? Well, they, they can tell when you're no longer, you know, you're, you're away for three, four months. It's not just the newspapers. <laughs> you can deal with the third class mail piling up. There are ways to do it. You tell the post office to hold it or you have a neighbor take it. But uh, it's an insidious beginning of something that we have to pay some attention to. Otherwise, they'll, they'll robotize us all the way. Yes. Um, I, uh, I was working a lot. Can you speak louder, please? I was working uh, in, up against logging companies. And uh, you gave something that gave us great advice about the concept of the public trust and pro private property rights as plural. And uh, that allowed us, with logging companies, corporations that were saying, hey, this is private property, we can do whatever the hell we want. And you were talking about the concept of the public trust and private property rights as plural, that it was a king and an individual at one time. So I wondered if you had any more thoughts on that. I think you explained it. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a common law doctrine, and it can be used against rapacious corporate exploitation either trying to use their own property in a very harmful manner, or they're trying to control public property. But it is something to look into. It's one of these ancient doctrines that, you know, we, some smart lawyers resurrect. And, and that's true in fiduciary responsibility doctrine as well. It's often called the law of equity. Uh, not strict black letter law, but the law of equity which we often hear about when you hear about mandamus and injunctions, for example. So that, that's, and this is going to be used in genetic, uh, in the fight on genetic engineering as well. Can I do one more? Anybody, uh, can we have just one more, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, I was just wondering, um, uh, what, what's it like to work for you? <laughs> One is you take your conscience to work. You never have to work on things you don't believe in. That's a pretty gratifying thing. Huh? Think of all the millions of people who have to leave their conscience at the door, right? Like all these GM people with the faulty ignition switch and they shut up because of fear. You know, being retaliated, forced out, whatever. The second is they don't make big money <laughs> because we want to get as many people working as possible. But they make quite a bit higher in minimum wage out of college. Uh, number three, uh, we give them more freedom uh, as one person than they deserve. That is, they can't handle the amount of freedom we give them. Uh, they want more direction because they're used to it in their lives, you know? Lesson plan, and this is what you do. And we believe in judgment, exercising judgment, intuition, innovation. We love new creative ideas. And it's not like they're pouring out. So we don't have that many new good ideas in civic action. It's still protest, demand, march, you know, rally. We really need a lot of creativity from you all. Uh, especially if you're not spending all your time trying to put out brush fires so you're not thinking. If you, if you have time to think, you know, ask yourself why 
In the last 150 years, we've gone from the from the carriage, horse carriage, and the whale oil lamp into what we now have, okay, huge innovation. We're still pretty much using, although we're using the internet and so on, but the, the strategy is pretty much the same. We, we don't know how to multiply ourselves very fast. Um, if we're anti-war, it's the same people coming out. Uh, but in the market area, they multiply very fast, don't they? Uh, whether they're video games or a whole mess of stuff. I have to eat humble pie on this one because uh, I don't understand this. I beg your understanding, but I started a Twitter follower a year and a half ago. I started to have Twitter. I hate the name, but what they call it. I don't do it. I have someone else do it. Yeah. You better not make any mistakes. <laughs> so he puts summaries on and things on. And we're up to 28,000 Twitter followers. I'm told that's not bad. You know, I mean, this, this is not Justin Bieber. <laughs> Britney Spears. Some baseball player. I'm willing to concede that. You know, I'm willing to concede some famous sports star has two million Twitter followers. But last uh, about 10 days ago I picked up the Sunday Washington Post magazine and the cover were dogs and cats and they're, they're discovering that your dog and cat smarter than you think even chickens now are considered smarter in many ways than cats these are animal scientists I, I believe we've just begun to discover how smart animals are because we dismiss them as Everything they do that we think is survival, it's all DNA, it's just instinct. It's like there's no learned behavior. We now know crows learn behavior and they pass it on. So, anyway, I open it up and it, there's at the bottom there are five famous <laughs> internet dogs and cats. <laughs> I, don't, I don't look at this stuff. You know? I, I have to take a double glance. You know? What's an internet dog and cat? I thought it was a an artificial thing. But no, it's actually dog and cats that are real. But people have taken a fancy to them. One cat's got a scowl. So the first one was a cat. I don't know, it's a sticking tent or something. Yeah, I don't know. Reading along. And then I freeze. The cat has 1.3 million Twitter followers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'm sure each, you're all going to buy five each. Five, one to the library, one to your college student, you know, one to your book club, one to whatever. Get going. It's easier than we think. Eat. Look, I've been battling this for 50 years now, so I got all the scars and all that. So I'm not Pollyannish. This book does not sugarcoat the obstacles. I go at them one at a time. What is my conclusion? It's easier than you think. Thank you.